we're recording. <clears throat> welcome everybody. Really excited to uh, welcome you here today. Uh, just a quick housekeeping rule. This session will be recorded and I will be sending out a copy of the recording to those who registered for the event. So um, you can look forward to seeing that in your email after the event. A uh, quick uh, welcome to uh, the Integrative Health Studies Department Interprofessional Experience Webinar. My name is Mary Beth Masenda, and I'm the Program Director for the Integrative Health Studies Department here at Maryland University of Integrative Health. Uh, this particular webinar is planned, organized, presented by the students in the Integrative Care Models course each spring. So uh, it's, a, it's an exciting assignment where they get to not only do some work that is relevant to what they're studying, but also share it out with our larger community. So that's something that we, uh, we honor and we think is really valuable, important to our MUIH community. Um, the purpose is to explore interprofessional concepts in integrative health. And this year, the students brought together three complementary health experts to discuss an interact integrative approach to the treatment of endometriosis. Uh, this event is for educational purposes only and would not replace the person-centered care that a patient's own practitioner would be providing for them. But it does give us, hopefully, a insight into what interprofessional collaboration might look like in the integrative health. Now, the 2022 class of integrative care models is made up of both Masters, so Bethany, if you want to change the slide. Made up of both masters and post baccalaureate students in the integrative health studies department. These women are forward thinkers and advocates for integrative health. Uh, they have diverse backgrounds, including personal training, yoga practitioners, educators, interpersonal communication experts, health and research. Uh, experts, as well as clinical mental health counseling. And I'm really honored to introduce the uh, team's uh, coordinator, Lori Stover, uh, and other team members, Christina Kelly, Claire Powderly, Christina Elliott, and Bethany Maxwell. I now turn over to Christina Kelly to introduce today's panelists. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on your Friday afternoon. Um, first, I'm going to introduce Julia Falk. She is a graduate of Saybrook University's Humanistic Psychology Program, and she also holds degrees in nursing and health education. She lives near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where she is an active in developing programs that support holistic health and well-being. She had a long career in nursing that culminated in her work to support people who live with chronic difficulty. She has taught mindfulness-based stress reduction for more than a decade, along with life story courses, mindful movement, and the practice of focusing. So welcome, Julia. We also have, let me get rid of my little pictures here so I can see. Next, we have Michelle Clow. She healed herself from a long term of Lyme disease through Qigong. This transforming experience inspired her to help others experience the deep restoration and profound healing of this ancient practice. Michelle is a Qigong Meridian Therapy Practitioner, a medical Qigong practitioner, certified in Dragon's Way Qigong Instructor, Wu Ming Qigong Breast Health Leader, certified healthy foot practitioner, and a licensed massage therapist since 2000. Michelle has over 22 years of bodywork, wellness, and teaching experience, and trains and studies under Grand Master Nan Lu, OMD. Welcome, Michelle. And last and definitely not least, we have Betsy Miller. She's a clinical herbalist and licensed nutritionist in the Northern Virginia area. She's completed her master's degree in herbal medicine at the Maryland University of Integrative Health, formerly Thai Sophia, and currently teaches in both their Western and Chinese herbal programs. Betsy is also a founding faculty member and current instructor with the Mid-Atlantic School of Herbalism located in College Park, Maryland. In addition to her teaching and clinical practice, Betsy makes a variety of herbal products that she sells at farmer's markets, herbal conferences, and online. 
that she truly believes in the healing magic of plants and all their many forms from teas and tinctures to salves and essential oils. On any given day, she's usually in her kitchen concocting up a new herbal potion or running around in the woods looking for new plants to harvest. Betsy focuses her practice, her medicine making, and much of her teaching on the concept of self-care, helping her clients and students to use plants and food as a way to come into a deeper, more intentional relationship with themselves. Welcome, Betsy. Okay, so the case study for our endometriosis webinar is provided, um, it's a combination of two parent, patients, I'm sorry. This doesn't reflect any one patient. The purpose of this case study is to illustrate how an interprofessional team would approach this patient in a collaborative way. The chief complaint is irregular and heavy menstruation, debilitating pain during menstruation, pain and bleeding during and after intercourse, infertility, major back, hip, and pelvic pain. The medical history for the patient uh, the patient's menstrual cycle started when she was 13 and had immediate pain. To reduce symptoms, she went to a gastroenterologist, and while she was under their care, she eliminated many items such as gluten, dairy, processed foods, and sugar, but nutritional interventions did not assist with the symptoms. She has also tried pharmaceutical interventions such as luprolide, ondandestrin, and nuvarin. Patient has also undergone pelvic physical therapy for discomfort during sexual intercourse. She's had a laparoscopy and a hysteroscopy performed in 2019. She has tried previous prescriptions such as Luprolide, Zofran, Nuvaring. She's currently on acetaphetamines and supplements are multivitamins, vitamin D and vitamin K. She is 5'5", weighs 130 pounds. Her diet mostly, um, mostly healthy, occasional alcohol use, has moderate activity three to five times per week, works full-time, supports partner and family. Her stress level is out of five, and she has poor sleep due to premenstruation, menstruation, and post-menstruation issues. Okay, um, I'm going to start off the questions. Um, I wanted to just start with asking each of the panelists um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourselves. Whoever wants to start. I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. Thanks for having me today. It's so lovely to be here. Um, so I am a Qigong Meridian Therapy Practitioner, and nobody knows what that is. So I'm going to take this time to just tell you a little bit about that. It, Qigong Meridian Therapy is like massage and acupuncture had a love child. So QMT, which is what we call it for short, it's actually a 5,000 year old Chinese healing art. It's been around for a long time. I use specialized hand techniques along meridians, your energy pathways, and specific acupuncture points to release physical, mental, emotional stress and pain. QMT fosters deep patient and it promotes profound self-healing. So it's sort of like a conversation starter for yourself so that you can realize greater awareness within your own body, your own mind, your own emotions, and your own spirit. And I'm Julie. Um, thank you for having me today. My background is if you were to go with longevity, my background is in nursing and I still have um, an active nursing license. The one kind of nursing that I've never done is OBGYN. So um, <laughs> I actually had to bone up on the actual medical background um, for today's presentation. But so much of what I do applies to all kinds of human suffering. I have a number of other modalities, you know, yoga, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction is, is the major one. Uh, somatic movement and focusing. So the thing that uh, that all has in common is that word that Michelle just used, awareness. Uh, they're very embodied practices and uh, that's 
you know, I, I, everything I do comes through that gate. My name is Betsy. I am a traditional Western herbalist um, and I specialize in women's reproductive health, particularly um, fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum care. Uh, but I work a lot with just general menstrual disorders, including uh, endometriosis. And um, the way herbalists work is depending on what your herbal background is, there's so many different traditions in herbal medicine. There's traditional Chinese medicine, there's Ayurveda. Um, I'm versed in traditional Western herbal medicine. So that's more of the, um, the blend of European herbalism that came to the United States. And um, we, we do work with symptom management, of course, but we also look at the deeper energetic patterns that are happening with the client. Uh, and I will talk about that when I have a slide for everyone to see later, kind of how we assess energetics. But we, uh, we, what makes us really unique as compared to allopathic medicine is that there's no one size fits all approach for herbal medicine when it comes to our clients. We're able to fit our formulas, whether they be teas or tinctures, or powders or, or capsules to the unique needs and experience of each client so that you know we could have five different clients coming to us with endometriosis and they would leave with five very different formulas. Great, thank you. Um, so our first question, um, each of, uh, question for each of you, what additional questions would you ask this patient? Whoever wants to start can just hop in. I'll start again. Um, so uh, I actually don't ask a tremendous amount of questions, but what I want to know is where are they experiencing the most pain in their body in the moment? Where is it most acute? That is going to help me to know which meridians and which acupuncture points I want to focus on. Um, I also want to know how they're feeling emotionally and same thing because that may indicate other meridians or other acupuncture points that need attention. But the main question that I ask is what do you want to tell me? You know, it's like what brought you in to experience Qigong meridian therapy? Um, because kind of like what Betsy was just saying, you know, I could have 10 people come through my door with endometriosis, same condition, they're all going to be there for very different reasons. So I, I just want to know what they want to tell me. And I tell them, you can tell me as much or as little as you like. And um, that's the most important question that I have. Yeah, I really agree um, with all of that. I think one of the things that sets the uh, complementary modalities apart, you know, is the degree of listening that we do and the degree of control that we give the client over what goes on. Um, so people do come in, sometimes we might think that pain would be their main complaint, but maybe that's not the goal that they have for themselves. So we really wanna find out on their perceptions of what the most important problems are and uh, you know, let them take the lead in that regard. Great questions. Um, similarly, I, I typically start every consult, even if I, I have their intake form, I've read their health history. I always love to start every consult by asking, you know, what brings you in today? Why are you interested in working with an herbalist? Um, I wrap up my consults with my favorite question, which is if I had a magic wand and I could make any three realistic changes in your health experience, what would those changes be? Um, Cause that really, you know, especially after spending an hour talking with this person, getting to know them, sometimes their answer to that question is different than what they might've said at the very beginning. So I always wait till the end of the appointment um, to ask that question. And then specific to this client, there's a few questions around um, particularly her menstrual cycle experience and her experience with endometriosis that I would want to know. Um, in the case history, it said that she'd had laparoscopic surgery to, um, in 2019, and I would want to know, you know, was that surgery able to identify the location of the endometrial tissue? 
um, because one of my favorite applications for working with endometriosis are uh, castor oil packs. So being able to know where on the body, if it's the abdomen, the pelvis, uh, where are we placing the castor oil packs for best access to um, endometrial tissue? I would also want to know um, how she's currently tracking her menstrual cycles and if she's able to, uh, to identify ovulation. Because again, with the herbs that we introduce, many of them are timed based on different, you know, phases within the uterine cycle and the ovulate and the ovulation cycle. Um, so having a little bit more information about how her her menstrual cycle is currently functioning would be really really helpful. Um, I also love when there's a. a pain scenario, asking a little bit more about the quality of the pain. So can she describe it? Is it sharp and stabbing or dull and achy? Because again, that helps inform which herbs are we, are we administering because herbs for dull, heavy, achy pain are going to be di very different than the herbs for, you know, sharp stabbing pain. Um, I like to know, you know, what do you do in life that makes the pain or your experience better? What makes it worse? So does it feel better to apply heat? Does it feel better to apply cold? Does movement aggravate or does movement support? How does rest feel? Um, and then one of you know, herbalism's favorite questions is what bowel pattern changes do you know leading up to your menstrual cycle and throughout your cycle? Uh, because that again helps inform us about really what's happening in the pelvic region, not just within the uterus, but all the systems that are interconnected that are related to her experience with endometriosis. Great, those are great questions. Um, our next one is how would you go about assessing and diagnosing this patient in your practice? So I, I don't diagnose ever. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse. I don't do any diagnosis. I could have someone walk through the door literally giving birth and I wouldn't say, I think you're pregnant because that's not my place or my job, but I do assess. And with the work that I do, my assessment comes from hands-on. My greatest assessment is when I am able to put my hands on the person um, because that is what I'm working with. I'm using my hands to focus on their energy, their chi, their meridians, specific acupuncture point. So I'm feeling for where chi is blocked, stagnant, deficient, and I'm also finding places that are, you know, beautiful and open and flowing freely. But my work is to open up those blockages, you know, kind of like if you think of a river that's been dammed up, things get junky and mucky and stagnant. And if you can take out that dam, then whoosh, you know, you have this beautiful, free flowing, wild river. And that's what we want, you know, for our chi. And when our chi is flowing freely, then, you know, pain, illness, physical, mental, emotional imbalance and upset can't remain. So my greatest assessment is with my hands. I too feel um, bound, you know, I have practiced boundaries. Uh, I'm not a doctor and I'm not licensed um, to do a medical diagnosis. But that said, um, I do assess, um, because problems don't always line up with medical diagnosis. So in my sort of problem-oriented assessment, one of the things that I would want to do, of course, relying on the patient's view, is to find out you know, about how this um, difficulty is affecting them in all the dimensions of their life. I think that's what makes it integrative. It's not just that you have you know, X number of different practitioner types. It's also how many dimensions of life um, are being intertwined in the patient's or client's experience. So you know, I might wanna know how are they sleeping? Is this hampering their ability to move? Um, is it having an effect on relationships? And just their whole, uh, you know, their time, their, even their finances. Uh, because life happens in all these dimensions. So um, I would want to know about that so that I could find out where I might be able to help them. And I also think that um, that taking the patient's view doesn't get let you off the hook for making your own observations, um, just to be able to see if the client's story is congruent 
with what you're observing about them. You know, it might be a person who says they have a level 10 of pain, um, you know, but they're, they look relaxed and, uh, or they might, if they're very stoic, they might say they've got a two and yet you can look at them and see that it's really worse than that. So um, th there's a lot that you can observe um, objectively that might be helpful as well. Uh, well, just like Michelle and Julie, I also do not diagnose um, herbalists. We're not a licensed profession. So I assess and recommend rather than diagnose, prescribe. Um, I do have a slide here to share just that will you know, help elaborate on some of the terms I'm going to use. Um, let's see, here we go. Um, let me know, oops, when you're able to see this. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. So in, uh, in traditional Western herbal medicine, when we assess a client, um, a, we're really basing our assessment on both, you know, what, especially what Julie touched on, observation of the client, uh, as well as the questions that we're asking. So when I ask into the quality of the pain, um, is it dull and achy or sharp and stabbing? I'm also watching how the client is holding their body. Uh, I do tongue diagnosis. So I look and see, is their tongue damp or dry? Is it, you know, bright red or pale pink? Uh, and all of these, these pieces of information are helping me uh, assess my client on this scale of energetics. Um, this was a chart created by one of my teachers, Jim McDonald, who is a brilliant herbalist. And um, it's based on the tradition of the four humors, which uh, dates back, you know, 2000 plus years. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking, is my client hot, dry, cold, damp? And then I decide, you know, is this client more sanguine, the, the air energetic? Are they, you know, the type of person who is just so, you know, likable and, and coming into the room and just grabs everyone's attention and has so many great ideas? Are they more melancholic, meaning they, more, they tend to be more, you know, rooted and grounded? They they reserve judgment on people or a situation until they've had more information. They like to come up with plans instead of being impetuous and jumping in like the melancholic. Are they phlegmatic, meaning the, the type of person who's very, you know, wrapped up in their emotions and the emotional world. They tend to be the more empathic individuals. Uh, are they more choleric, like the, you know, let's get it done CEO type. And what I love about this, this paradigm is that it really helps inform how I make recommendations. So for example, the choleric that's very driven and motivated, um, they respond really well to, all right, I'm going to set you a challenge. And with this challenge, I need you to eat three servings of vegetables every single day. And the cleric person is like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. This is great. I got that. You know, versus the phlegmatic that we have to tend to, you know, tend to start slow and, and kind of work in new changes and recommendations because change can be hard. So um, when I'm assessing a client, I'm looking both at what are their overall constitutional energetics, you know, so this is how they were innately born, their, you know, their constitution, but also what are the energetics of their current uh, health concerns? So endometriosis, um, you know, can be, it, we tend to, to identify that as more of a damp stagnant condition because there is essentially stuck tissue. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have hot experiences with the, the heat of stabbing pain. So when I'm sitting with a client, I'm really trying to figure out where in this chart are they, uh, or in this paradigm, do they fit? And that really helps me fit the unique herbs to the unique client. Great. That was super interesting perspectives. Um, our next question is, what would each of your approaches be to support and empower this patient? For me, um, to, to support and empower, one of the things I want to know is, do they feel safe? Um, and it's not something that I might, I might not necessarily ask that directly. I would say most of the time I wouldn't ask that directly, but people cannot heal if they don't feel safe. If they don't feel safe in their body, if they don't feel safe in their environment, healing is going to be very difficult. Safety is vital. So, you know, like 
I don't want to say nothing else matters, but like that is sort of a, a top priority. So sometimes you can tell, um, sometimes, you know, that's something for them to explore on their own, but I want to know, or I want, I want to know if they feel safe and I want them to know whether or not they feel safe. So I will encourage people to explore where they do feel the safest and where they do feel the most vulnerable in their body and in their environment. And again, that can be a conversation with me. I'm happy to do that, but also it can just be a conversation with themselves or you know, it can be a conversation they have with someone else, but I do encourage them to explore that. And then I also offer some tools to help them explore that. And so particularly for endometriosis, the two uh, best tools I would give them, because I try not to bog people down with too many things is, well, because if you make things too complicated or too time consuming, you know, people aren't gonna do them and that doesn't help anyone. So the first one is to throw eggs. And it sounds, might sound a little kooky, but oh man, it's so effective. So painting with a broad brush, endometriosis, it's about stasis. And we want to get that chi moving. We want to get that energy up and out and throwing eggs against a tree or a wall and having them break is really empowering and can really get that chi moving up and out. And if I can you know, get the person to scream while they do it, even better. Um, and it is, I've done it myself many times and I've recommended it to many people and it's so effective. I have even had people, um, I had one person who kept a dozen eggs in her refrigerator that was specifically throwing eggs. So anytime she needed to, they were right there. Um, so that helps to get that chi moving up and out and helps just to get everything flowing again. And then the other suggestion is to do something creative. It doesn't matter what it is, but something creative so that we can give their pain an opportunity to live outside the body and not have to be carried around inside the body. So it can be whatever they want. I, I mean, then they, again, it can be something that they share with others or something that they do just for themselves, but doing something creative to give that that pain a home outside. I think it's a, it is a really valuable insight that Michelle introduced, you know, about safety, um, particularly in, you know, in our society, trauma is everywhere. And um, I would guess that with this particular diagnosis where intercourse has been painful, you know, there's probably some, some trauma held in the body from that experience alone. So um, being sensitive to the presence of trauma is, is really important for all of us. And um, that means never doing anything without permission. It means um, letting people take it at their own speed and, you know, really placing them in control and, and giving them agency in every way that we can, including um, giving them resources so they can look up the information themselves because um, activating people is, is really important, not just feeding them information, but teaching them how to help themselves. I agree with both of, of those points on safety and um, particularly in, with a condition that's related to the, you know, the reproductive tract. That's a very um, private, sacred part of the body. So having a sense of safety is, is of complete and utmost importance. Um, similarly to that, a big part of the way I work with my endometriosis clients is focusing on how is living with endometriosis affecting your quality of life? So how is this affecting your interpersonal relationships? How is this affecting your, you know, your sleep, your stress, your eating? Because 
it's not just, you know, as we know, there's no isolated system or experience. So endometriosis begins to permeate into every facet of life. So where is this most showing up for you and how, how can I support you in those areas? Um, physiologically, there's a couple of main areas that I look to support with, um, uh, with endometriosis. Number one is just simply pain management. Um, most people living with endometriosis experience, you know, severe, severe pain or at the very least fluctuations from, you know, mild to severe pain. Um, so I look to herbs for, for just symptom and pain management. Um, then I do a lot of immune support because there is substantial evidence that shows uh, endometriosis is an immunological based disorder. So uh, I look to herbs that are able to modulate inflammatory you know, mediators like cytokines. Uh, so we work with deep immune tonics as well as some of the more surface level immune support herbs. Um, I look to lymphatic herbs that are able to improve pelvic and abdominal circulation. Um, because the circulation and lymphatic function is so deeply tied to immune management, uh, as well as helping to prevent tissue from adhering where we don't want it to adhere. Uh, female reproductive tonics, especially herbs that are able to strengthen the uterus. A big issue with endometriosis is retrograde flow, where that blood is flowing back in a direction it's not supposed to, and that's causing endometrial tissue to relocate throughout the body. Uh, so uh, herb, herbs that are considered uterine tonics to help strengthen and tone the uterus so that the uterus is better able to control uh, the flow of blood and um, uh, prevent some of that retrograde flow from happening. And then um, supplements like, and I'll get to protocol a little bit later, but supplements like uh, essential fatty acids and magnesium to help with uh, relaxation and inflammatory response. Um, I did put together, let me pull up my slide here, just a sample um, <clears throat> protocol or formula that I, I would use with this client. Um, let me share my screen really quickly just so I can show you all an example of what the, an herbal protocol would look like. All right. Uh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so this is just a sample herbal protocol. Um, this is uh, a favorite blend of mine for managing uh, pain. The blend is uh, Corydalis, uh, Jamaica Dogwood, Wild Yam, which is the, the herb in the background that you can see there, and Viburnum prunifolium, which is cramp bark. So the Wild Yam and the cramp bark are very specific for dealing with the type of cramping and spastic pain that we see with endometriosis. The Corydalis and the Jamaica Dogwood are very specific for inhibiting the pain, the pain response and the pain experience. Um, this, so this is essentially a, like a core foundational formula I would use for pain management. Then again, if the client had more dull, achy pain, I might incorporate some ginger in there that accelerates you know, circulation to the pelvis. If it's more sharp stabbing pain, then I would think more of the, um, the overt uh, anti-spasmodic herbs. So maybe a higher dose of the diascorea or the viburnum. So I would absolutely tailor this formula to the need of each unique individual client. Cause again, you know, there's no one size fits all here with, with our clients. Um, a second formula I, I typically recommend is for immune and endocrine balance. So there's several Chinese herbs in here. I will say I am not a Chinese herbal practitioner. So my understanding of how they affect chi and, you know, Chinese energetics is minimal. Um, I'm thinking more of these from a, a physiology standpoint, what they're doing pharmacologically. Uh, so Shizandra and Ramania are both very unbelievably amazing adaptogens that have a particular affinity for women's reproductive health. Uh, a big piece of, of endocrine imbalance with endometriosis uh, is an imbalance in, in particular, progesterone and estrogen, which uh, Shizandra and Ramania are both very effective at helping to balance that. Um, Shizandra also has an affinity for the liver. And in herbal medicine, we view stagnant conditions, particularly related to women's reproductive health, as being connected to the liver because of the liver's ability to help uh, modulate hormone balance. Um, peony in particular, peony and uh, Romania is another very indicated blend in traditional Chinese medicine for working with patterns like endometriosis. Uh, Angelica is very specific for helping to modulate inflammatory prostaglandins, 
Echinacea, we always think about for colds and flus, but it's so much more than that. Uh, it's going to help, again, modulate some of those inflammatory mediators like the cytokines that are partially at play here in the endometriosis picture, as well as, you know, I am a strong believer that, that echinacea is a nervine, meaning an herb that helps modulate nervous system function. Uh, it binds to many of the same receptors as cannabis. So we know that it can affect the endocannabinoid system, which is brilliant. Uh, and then Fulcaria splendens is my favorite lymphatic herb. It's Ocotillo uh, for working with pelvic congestion. And endometriosis is absolutely a condition of pelvic stagnation and congestion. Uh, and then lastly, and both, I should say, both of these are tincture formulas. So uh, if you've ever, I don't have a tincture bottle sitting here in front of me, but if you've ever seen a tincture, they're like the little uh, glass bottles that have a dropper. And you, uh, I typically dilute the tincture dose in water and, you know, take it like a shot and get it over, over with because most of our tinctures don't taste very good. Um, uh, but the final formula, um, that I would recommend for this client would be a, uh, uterine tonic and nervous system support tea. I mentioned, you know, this importance of focusing on quality of life that, uh, the toll living with a chronic disease, especially a pain-based chronic disease, uh, takes a huge toll on the nervous system and our ability to, to really process life. And herbs are just so wonderful at helping to support our nervous system as we walk through life with a chronic disease. Um, so Skullcap is my, um, my tried and true favorite, I couldn't live without it, Nervine tonic herb. It really helps strengthen the resiliency of the nervous system. Um, Alcamilla vulgaris, which is ladies mantle is a powerful uterine tonic. So again, I mentioned herbs that are going to help strengthen the uterine's capacity to prevent retrograde flow, uh, chamomile gentle antispasmodic. So this is going to support, uh, reducing pain and spasm throughout the month. Um, but also it's, you know, such a fantastic nervine. So it's going to help calm down nervous system excitability, Calendula as another lymphatic, again, to help with um, lymphatic, lymphatic flow when we're dealing with a stagnant condition. Blue vervain, which is a liver support herb, a nervine, and also very, very effective for helping with the uh, estrogen progesterone imbalance that we see in um, endometriosis. Yarrow, my favorite quote about yarrow is that yarrow knows what to do with the blood when there's too much blood, if there's not enough blood, Yarrow knows what to do with the blood. So uh, anytime there's a menstrual disorder with excessive bleeding or inappropriate bleeding, which we see with her breakthrough bleeding throughout the month, I always think about including Yarrow as part of that. Um, and cinnamon, which is put in there for partially for taste because some of these herbs are very, very bitter. Um, but also cinnamon brings a little bit of movement and activity to the uterus, but it's also wonderfully astringent in the uterus. So again, helping with excessive blood flow and tone. Um, so that's as an herbalist, that's how I would work with, with this client initially, and then tailor these formulas to her specific needs after learning more about her. It's a really good observation, you know, that um, chronic pain is different than acute pain that you get from an injury or a short-term illness. Uh, it, it really is its own diagnosis. So not you know, people who have acute pain, that's activated in one particular area of the brain. But when you live with it for a long time, it takes on a life of its own and it activates um, areas of the brain that are related to emotion, mood, memory, uh, behavior, and decision-making. Absolutely. So it makes it really important. I mean, it really, cha it really changes your life. Uh, and also you have the thing where people don't believe you. Right. That's a huge, right? yeah. especially in women's reproductive health. That's a, a really big part of all of women's medicine, really. Um, so that's where things like uh, anything that you can do to take away part of that, that conglomerate of chronic pain. You know, you have the piece that's a physical condition. You have the piece that's the story in your mind about the physical. Mm -hmm. You have the piece that's the stress and probably a lot of other pieces. So um, stress reduction becomes really important. Yeah. Mindful movement that keeps the body mobile, somatic exercises that help you release muscle tension because we tighten around our pain. Um, and mm -hmm. just, just learning to be to divorce yourself from the stories 
so that at least then all you have is the the piece that's physical pain and you can right. down. that's such a huge distinction is the the phenomena and the story about the phenomena so the phenomena is the pain you know there is pain in this body and what's our story about the pain and we can all create different stories around our pain and you know how can we help this client shift their story to one that's big enough to live in when it comes to living with their pain Right. The story actually makes your pain receptors more sensitive. It's not your imagination. Absolutely. It's physiological. So um, if it, that is the way to get at it. Absolutely. And there's so many other complementary therapies that we could talk about, you know, incorporating like, you know, somatic retraining. I'm working with a client now who has chronic bowel pain. And part of what I have her do is work with a somatic therapist to actually retrain the way her brain interprets and experiences pain. So hot and cold therapy is, you know, the, the possibilities for collaboration around pain are endless. And totally essential. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I think that's a good segue into our next question. Um, if each of you were working together on this patient, how would you work together on what was concerning you and how would you want to approach this case? It is a great segue because the story is so important. And so if Julie and Betsy and I were working together with Julie, I would be interested in collaborating to come up with mindfulness techniques that would help help the person with their story. And then from my perspective and from the TCM point of view that I come from is, you know, my Qigong grandmaster says all the time, the body never lies, you know, and everything that's happening is happening for us. It's not happening to us, it's happening for us. That doesn't mean that it feels comfortable or good, but in the big picture, it's happening for us. So with Julie, I think it would be interesting to explore mindfulness ways for the patient to look into what the why of this, why this might be happening for them. Um, and then with Betsy, so again, like herbs and food, they have chi. Like anything that's alive has chi. And so I would be interested in collaborating to talk about like, cause I'm not an herbalist. I've taken herbs and had great success and herbs are great, but I'm not an herbalist. I'm not knowledgeable about suggesting them to other people. Um, but they do contain chi and she, you know, all the things she was talking about before, like, you know, you use this herb for this thing and this herb for this thing. And the way that I would look at it is because, you know, this vibrates at this frequency, this vibrates at this frequency. And so helping the person to choose herbs and foods that will help support their chi. And so like, like one way to kind of think about the differences, like if you think about a peanut, that grows underground, you know, in the dark, covered up in a heavy, dense environment, it's going to have much different chi than an apple that is growing, hanging in the air, you know, surrounded by the eat, surrounded by heavenly chi that's, you know, slowly developing over almost a whole year. Like one isn't better than the other, but they're very different, you know, just in the way that they they grow and experience universal chi. So I would, those, that's where my interests would lie in collaboration. Yeah. And I'm building off of that. You know, I think there's so much feedback that I would love if I was working with Julie and Michelle about what they're noticing with the client, especially in relation to, you know, we've started these herbs and these were my goal for the herbs. And what are you all noticing, especially in terms of her stress management and coping and her frequency and resonance? What are you noticing since she started the herbs? Is she holding her tension like this or is she emotionally just lax and everywhere? So do I need to do herbs that are more relaxant or herbs that are more like building and supporting? So the, the potential for feedback from other practitioners observing my client from different angles would be, you know, I, I wish I had that for every single client uh, because I, you know, I do, I learn so much from my clients and 
sometimes it can be really hard for a client to notice a subtle shift. And it can be easy, easier for an outside party, like a practitioner to notice those subtle shifts. So I would, you know, having, having more sets of eyes on observation of subtle shifts would be just such a beautiful tool for every single client. Lori and I have often reflected, you know, how wonderful it would be to have collaborative practices. And I don't know, maybe it's different in the big city, but that opportunity doesn't come along too often uh, right. in my own life and practice. Okay, um, our next question is, if your patient said they wanted to come off medications or supplements, how do you communicate with the prescribing practitioner to make sure it is done effectively, effectively and safely? So for me, like I said before, your body never lies. So if they are feeling in their heart and their guts, like I always tell people, like if it feels good here and here, I'm tapping my guts, um, then you know you're on the right track. If it doesn't feel good here and then your guts, you're not on the right track, painting with a very broad brush. So if they were feeling, you know, in their heart and their guts that they wanted to come off their medication, then I would encourage them to listen to that and to talk to their prescribing practitioner. Um, I am not gonna say, listen to your heart and throw your prescriptions in the trash. Like, no, um, <laughs> that wouldn't be good. But if you are notice, noticing a shift in how you feel about prescriptions you're taking or supplements you're taking or herbs you are taking, then perhaps, you know, you have shifted and it's time to look at a change or something different. Um, but I'm not an herbalist. I don't prescribe anything. Um, so from my end, all I could offer would be kind of like how we were just talking with the previous question is to offer any changes and any observations that I'm seeing to the prescribing practitioner and say, okay, well, yeah, I've noticed that, you know, you've reduced X, Y, and Z. Now I am seeing this in the person. So um, since I am not a prescriber, all I could offer, not that that's not a lot, is um, my observations in the differences or no changes uh, that I'm seeing. Now, I'm personally pretty skeptical about the value of a lot of um, medic allopathic medications, um, especially pain medications and psychoactive meds, uh, because you know the side effects can be so tremendous and all the interactions and things like that. Um, so I don't blame anybody, and I'd actually like to see people come off a lot of the medicines that they're on. Um, but I also know that weaning is um, not a simple process for every med, especially the ones that have the most side effects. It seems like you have to be really careful uh, weaning off of them so that you don't set off another kind of crisis. So, um, you know, my go-to would always be don't wean yourself without anybody knowing about it because um, that can really really be dangerous. And I could as a nurse, um, although I don't prescribe, I could educate people about what to expect from medicines and about the precautions uh, that they need to have. So I really would uh, encourage them. And then I would help them, you know, through the various modalities to deal with the effects of weaning. You know, if there are uh, things that come back on board as they weed themselves off the medicines, uh, I try to help them deal with that through the different modalities. So just like Ms. Michelle said, I, you know, I'm an herbalist, I'm not a doctor. I can't give any recommendations about what a client can do with their pharmaceuticals, with their prescriptions. That's not my place. Um, but Julie said the exact thing that I believe, which is we can empower through education. So when I have clients who are on medications, <clears throat> if I have a concern about either the medication or the dosage or the ongoing dosage alongside herbal medicines, um, what I do is I empower my client with, with questions. I, I 
arm them, if you will, with the questions that I think they should discuss with their prescribing physician, because so many people can get this deer in the headlights uh, look or, you know, manner when they're in front of their doctor and they don't know the questions to ask about their pharmaceuticals. They don't know what the potential benefits or dangers or, you know, interactions are. So um, I, I give my client a recommended list of questions that I want them to discuss with their doctor um, and a recommended, you know, conversation to have with their doctor, how to express their concerns or my concerns through them. Um, a lot of the clients that I work with, my fertility clients have either previously done or are currently undergoing, uh, fertility treatments. And that is a very drug heavy regimen. So from the herbalist perspective, what I do is I write up my full protocol for the client, including, you know, all of the herbs, the dosages and any clinically relevant herb drug interactions that they need to be aware of. And I say clinically relevant because unfortunately most allopathic practitioners aren't well educated around herbal medicines and will, you know, go to PubMed or whatever their preferred database is, look up an herb, look up a drug and see red flags everywhere for interactions. And it's my job to say, well, those, you know, interaction potentials were based on high doses given to animals. And that's not how herbs work in the human body at a reasonable dose. So um, the best thing that I can do as an herbalist for my client is give them all of the information that they need about their protocol, about questions and concerns around medications and send them to their, uh, their prescribing physician as educated as possible to have that conversation. Great, thank you. Um, we have a little less than 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna turn it over to Christina Elliott for the Q&A portion. Thank you so much. So I had a, a couple questions that were coming in. Um, I'll start with the first one. So the question that came in is, are there any similarities in treating endometriosis with treating other reproductive conditions, for example, like fibroids and PCOS? For me, so uh, like we touched on before, um, there are and there aren't. So like I said, like I could have 10 people come through my door with endometriosis. And so they all have the, technically have the same condition, but um, they're there for different reasons. So these are all sort of in that kind of reproductive umbrella, but they're, they're the underlying story slash reason slash chi reason is going to be different. So. The, from my perspective, the treatment could be similar in that they're all under the sort of reproductive arena. So that's, you know, involves similar meridians and acupuncture points, but the reason that they're having that physical experience is going to be different for each of them. And that part of it will be very unique to each person. That was great. Um, as a follow-up question to that, um, what are some of the best herbs for chi, specifically for female reproductive system, and what's the frequency and vibration of that system? Um, so quickly, just touching on the previous question about, um, you know, are there similarities in how I would approach these different conditions? Um, where the similarities overlap is in the, the general what we call actions of herbs. So many of the, these, these conditions are gonna require uterine tonics, lymphatic herbs. The nuance comes in the different herbs that each client receives. So yes, there's a lot of overlap in terms of general categories of herbs that would benefit these conditions. But then the job of the herbalist is to figure out what are the energetics of this person what are the energetics of their, their health experience and which herbs can help fit both of those pictures. And that's where, you know, the five different clients with fibroids leave with five different formulas. Those five formulas will likely all have uterine tonics, uh, lymphatic herbs, blood movers, but the individual herbs are going to be different for each client. Um, the question about, you know, I, I personally, I don't work with with chi or vibrations necessarily. So I'm not the most equipped person to answer that question. Um, there are certain herbs that 
have an affinity for the reproductive tract that are just, you know, their, their, if you will, their specialty lies within the female reproductive tract. Things like raspberry leaf is such a beautiful uterine tonic when given as, as a tea. Uh, herbs that, you know, like Vitex that have very specific effects on the balance of estrogen, progesterone, prolactin. So there are certain herbs that have a very strong affinity for the reproductive tract. However, I can't say there are best herbs for the reproductive tract because I couldn't use raspberry leaf when I was pregnant because it caused preterm contractions, but everyone else uses raspberry leaf, right? So there's no, you know, there's no best herb for the female reproductive tract. It's what herb is best for this client. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I can't answer questions about chi and, and vibrations because that's not my area of expertise. <clears throat> Perfect. The next question that comes in, um, are you guys aware of any newly discovered root causes to endometriosis? And if so, what are some of the nutrition and lifestyle interventions associated to it? I think a lot of the current research is really focused on endometriosis as an autoimmune disorder, which is fascinating. And I think that's very, very, you know, I think that's, that's key because uh, so much of what I do is work with immune support, you know, with endometriosis. Um, so I, you know, I think the, the autoimmune approach is, is going to be moving forward. One of the primary focuses with endometriosis. Yeah. And in terms of how that would influence lifestyle, um, you know, living, uh, living an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, uh, includes a whole bunch about diet, uh, not, you know, you have to kind of go through a process of finding what triggers you and what doesn't. But there are certainly some things that are really common triggers, like gluten and uh, different grains and nightshades and, and things like that. You just have to find out what's true for your body. Uh, stress reduction, again, uh, and, you know, really paying attention to anything that's going to cause inflammation and autoimmune response and stay active. Uh, really important for people with autoimmune challenges to be active to the best of their ability because that's a great antidepressant. It's great at fighting inflammation and just generally making life a whole lot better. That's great feedback. Thank you so much. Um, going back to the previous question, Michelle, I think this question is uh, for you as it relates to kind of chi and um, uh, the frequency and vibration of the system. Are you able to speak a little bit to that from that perspective? Not from herbs, because uh, are you talking about the, yeah, so I can't talk about the um, chi in relation to herbs because I'm not an herbalist. And so I can't, that I can't talk about, but Painting with a very broad brush, I will say that kind of combining the last two questions from the point of view, the, you know, the lens through which I work, everything is about chi. Like we are energy, we have our body and that's fantastic. And our body is made up of bones and blood and flesh, tissues, organs. That's all great. Made, all that's made up of cells. Cells are made up of atoms. Open up an atom guess what's inside, ta-da, it's energy, or chi, or prana, or you know, whatever you want to call it. Cultures all have different names for it, but it's that vital life force energy that runs through us all and makes us who we are. And so that's what I work with, and that's what we are at our root. So whether someone comes to me with endometriosis, or insomnia, or irritable bowel, or eczema or whatever, or anxiety, or fill in the blank, underneath it all, she's out of balance. Like that is the broad brush, big lens. And so if we can help bring that back into balance, then, you know, it will help rectify what's showing up in the physical body. The interesting thing to me is we could have anything happen to us. So why endometriosis and not migraines? Like there's a specific reason 
that we have the things that show up for us in the physical body, which goes back, you know, earlier we talked about exploring our story and exploring why. So ultimately underneath everything, from my point of view, it's she is in balance, but um, we want to, we want to look at that, why it is happening for us. I feel like I'm racing the clock. So I'm like, Ugh. no, that was great. That was super, super helpful. Um, while you're still in the hot seat, so to speak, one last final question that came into the chat. Um, if you're a vegan or you have a vegan patient, instead of throwing eggs, what's another good substitute that you would recommend? Oh man, that's such a great question. So I want to say two things. One, uh, veganism aside, some people would be like, oh man, I don't want to waste food, you know, and I get that. But I'm like, if it helps you, you know, something doesn't have to be consumed for it to be of value. Like if it helps you to heal, then that was not a waste. That is not addressing the vegan side. So if you would like to have an experience like that without using food or animal products, then you can stomp on bubble wrap. You can get a wiffle ball bat and beat a pill. You can break glass. So like the recycling center where I live, you actually have to throw the glass over this little chain link fence into this cinder block area. It's amazing because you get to throw the glass and it smashes and it is like, and then another helpful way to help get things up and out is just yelling and screaming. And if you feel like, like, so if I stand on the street corner and I'm yelling and screaming, people are going to be like, that's a crazy lady. But if I hold a phone up to my ear, the phone does not have to be on. You don't have to call anyone. If I hold a phone up to my ear and I'm yelling and screaming, all of a sudden everyone's like, ooh, somebody's getting it. So if you're somewhere where you feel like you need to just get something up and out, just hold a phone up to your ear and be like, I tell you what, I can't believe that, you know, I'm whoosh, there, it's up, it's out, it's done. So Great recommendation. Thank you so much. This is yeah. going to sound silly, but I did see this on an episode of Grey's Anatomy that the therapist, <laughs> the person had the patient throwing, you know, like bean bags or wet balls of cloth at the wall as well. So, you know, I always thought that looked like a fun release. <laughs> yeah. And I will, I will add, you don't want to do something where you're breaking something in your hands. So, cause this, the center of your hands relates to your heart. You don't want to break your own heart. So make sure it's something that's going ah, up, out, and away. And before we all totally get out of here, in the, I don't know what it's, I can't, losing the word, the references, or I did provide a link to a short two minute video for the four energy gates, which is four points on your body that you can either self massage or tap that can give you a total body chi tune up and just give you a general boost if anyone is interested in exploring that. That's so amazing. Thank you so much, Michelle, and, and to our panelists. Um, we'll be sharing out the slides uh, after to everyone who's registered. So you'll get these. And also I, I shared out Betsy's formulas. Uh, reminder, this is for educational purposes only. So you do wanna check in with your practitioners first before starting any of them. Um, but a big thank you to Betsy, Julie, and Michelle. This is amazing. Uh, I, we really appreciated your perspectives and for the amazing whole person approach and caring for people with endometriosis. I wanted to also thank uh, Chris Sachs. She was on the call, but she had to leave, but she's our provost and she has been super supportive of this whole process and uh, really grateful for her support in allowing my students to come together and to present this to our community. Finally, big thank you to the students of INH 610 Integrative Care Models. You are amazing. You did a great job pulling this together. And I'm so grateful for what you were able to accomplish um, and to create this. So thank you. Uh, before going, I put in the chat a survey, a link to a survey. We'd really appreciate your feedback uh, so that uh, we can continue to grow and improve and we hope you all have a great weekend and thank you so much for coming.